and welcome to lecture 20 part 2 where we're going to talk about electron configurations. So what are they? All they are is they are a string of characters that describe the distributions of electrons among the possible states. So how many types of each electron do you have? Now this distribution or how we spread them out is reliant or depends on two things. Number one, electrons will distribute themselves in a manner that minimizes the energy. So I was saying Mother Nature is a lazy slob. This focuses on the lazy part. So the idea is that you put electrons in the lowest energy state that is available and then just work your way up. And this overall depends on uh, the values of the quantum numbers N, L, and actually the spin as well. We haven't talked about that one. We will. And this is referred to as the Aufbau principle, um, which simply states that you build up atoms by adding an electron to the element before it because you're just adding, you're going up, you're adding electrons in the least energetic way possible. And they're actually pretty straightforward to, to do. So you start from the lowest energy state, um, which is 1s, and then put no more than two each until you have assigned all of the electrons a type. So for example, we will start with the simplest one possible, hydrogen. So here I'm using boxes to represent the electron type. So the, the lowest energy state is the 1s state. Hydrogen has one electron, so I'm going to put one in there. And that is it. Now drawing boxes or lines or whatever can get a little bit tedious, and so scientists develop the shorthand this. So the this the 1s here just tells you the 1s state and the superscript number here tells you how many of the, that kind of electron you have, which in this case is 1 and this particular character string right here is properly what is an electron configuration. So let's do another example. Helium. So let's start with our 1s state as well. And helium has two electrons in it. So you could have one 1s electron. Now the rule is that, think back to the Pauli exclusion principle from last time, that um, no two electrons can have the same four quantum numbers, which means that if they have the same state, um, that the spin has to be different. That's the number we didn't talk about very much. It's also the one that only has two values. So if there's already a 1s electron, which there is, the other one has to have the opposite spin. And we just show that as an arrow pointing the other way. So this is the one spin value and this is the other spin value. Now, what's the electron configuration for helium? Also, that those are the two electrons and it's just 1s2. Um, so you don't call this like squared or cubed, it is just the number. So you would verbalize this as 1s2. Now, this is it for the n equals 1 shell, because the next available state is 2s. And it is important to know that completely filled shells are actually quite stable. Remember, this is why the, and this is why the noble gases actually don't really do much of anything because they're quite happy the way they are. And so completely filled shells result in low chemical reactivity. All right, so let's um, do the next element, which is lithium. Now lithium, a neutral lithium, lithium atom has three electrons. So hopefully you've got a periodic table, you know, next to the screen here. So we're going to start with the two electrons that are al that are already going to go in the 2s state, and that's all, or the 1s state, and that's all that it can handle. So the next available state is that of a 2s state, and we've had one more electron to assign, so boom, it goes there. And the electron configuration of lithium would just be this, 1s2, 2s1 telling you that a neutral lithium atom has two 1s type electrons and one 2s type electrons. Now I can throw some more vocabulary at you. The 
outermost electrons, the last ones that you add in, remember these things are getting increasingly further and further away from the nucleus. These are called valence electrons. And the ones that are not on the outermost shell are called core electrons. This is important because in the, um, these are the ones that do the chemistry. And so the number and the type of valence electrons that an element has tells you a lot about how it's going to act. So let's do one more example. Beryllium. So if you look at your periodic table, beryllium is element number four, telling you that a neutral beryllium atom has four electrons in it. The electron configuration that we built for lithium has three, so we just have to add one more to it. There is one more slot available um, for the 2s types. So the fourth electron is going to be also a 2s electron, but the spin will be down. And its electron configuration is simply 1s2, 2s2. Hopefully now you kind of get the idea. So let's just keep going down or going across that row. The next one is boron. So neutral boron has five electrons. Um, the configuration that we built for beryllium has four, so we need one more. But we can't add another, that fifth electron can't be a 2s type because we already have two of them. So energetically, the next lowest one are the 2p electrons. Now remember that um, p subshells have three states in them that can, um, so you can have up to six p type electrons. So that's why I drew the three boxes. And, but I just need one. And it doesn't really matter where you put it. So the electron configuration of boron is 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. Now, carbon. So this is element six. And this is an important one because this demonstrates the second guiding principle of electron configurations. So carbon has six electrons. So it's going to be the electron configuration of the element right before it, boron, plus one more electron. Now, um, you can... So the idea is that where would this other electron go within this 2p subshell right here? You could put it here in the same in the same state as the as the fifth electron, but with the spin going the other way, or you could put it by itself in a in one of the other two two p states. And it turns out that determining how many unpaired electrons there are in an atom is pretty simple and you get pretty unambiguous results. And this configuration seems to be the case, that the electrons uh, adopt separate 2p states um, in this case. And now the electron configuration actually looks the same either way. It's just 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. but so this is called Hund's rule, which is electrons occupy empty degenerate states if possible. So they like to spread out. I often like to call this the sibling bedroom sharing rule. So when we're in person, I usually ask anyone, you know, if they've shared a, a bedroom with a sibling. And if they did so because they love that sibling so much, they wanted to spend their entire, as much time as possible with them, or there simply just weren't enough bedrooms in the house. And usually it's the latter. Um, so these spread out when they can, and you don't pair them up until you have to. So let's see how that would work. No. So the next element, and don't worry, I'm not doing the entire periodic table, would be nitrogen. So nitrogen is going to be the configuration of carbon plus one more electron. And it's going to occupy the other 2p state. Um, again, so you've got three unpaired electrons in nitrogen. And it isn't until the next element, so it's configuration, I'm sorry, is 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. So oxygen is going to be, you know, it's element eight, so it's the configuration of nitrogen plus one more. 
And now, since you have all of these 2P states sort of singly occupied, then you can start to pair them up. And so that's what the configuration of oxygen looks like. Well, that's, that's what the distribution looks like. The actual electron configuration string is just this 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. And you could keep going. So fluorine, we're just going to add one more electron to oxygen. There you go. And its configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p5. Now you can see that, again, we're just adding you know, an electron to each one. And just to finish out the second row, neon, 10 electrons. Uh, so there's one more slot in the 2p subshell. And so that's just going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. And at this point, you will note, ignore that red thing, that in this case, the entire n equals 2 shell is filled. Filled shells, very stable, unreactive, neon, noble gas, doesn't do much of anything. All right, so let's do one more. So element number 11 is sodium. So the 1s states are full, the 2s states are full, the 2p states are all, are all full. So the next one turns out to be 3s. You have one more electron to add, so there you go. And that gives you a configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and 3s1. Now, let us review. Now, a couple things. Um, you'll note that this 1s2, 2s2, 2p6 is actually the electron configuration of neon. Um, you can probably guess that as you progress to the third, fourth, and fifth row that these configurations can get a bit unwieldy. So the convention is that you can use the noble gas before your element as shorthand. So I could just say instead of this 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, this is the configuration of neon. with an additional 3s electron. So we call that noble gas shorthand. Now let's review, let's go back to lithium, right? So lithium could be described as by that shorthand helium 2s1. Now you will note the similarities, right? That both of these elements have a noble gas core and then an additional single S-type electron. In this case, it's a 2S electron. In this case, it's a 3. And so elements where the last electron or last sets of electrons are the same type, same valence electrons, tend to have very similar properties. And this is why lithium and sodium have very similar chemical properties. They are both you know, kind of soft, dull gray metals, and they, you know, react explosively with water and other things like that. And you will also know, and this is why that they ended up in the same column in the periodic table. So now we actually have a reason why everything in the periodic, you know, all the elements in the periodic table, they were originally lined up so that things in the same column had similar chemical properties. And now we actually know why that is. So all of the elements in group one have a single S-type electron as their valence electrons, and they all act very similarly. Likewise, if you look at the configurations like beryllium and magnesium, they end up with, they have in their valence shells, two S-type electrons, and they're quite similar. And this kind of goes all the way to the other end, um, fluorine. And so the halogens, group seven or 17, and they're for valence electrons, they all have two S-type valence electrons and five P-type valence electrons. 
whether it's you know 2s 2p 3s 3p and this is why you know fluorine chlorine and bromine and iodine under them all have very similar properties and also why the noble gases they all have completely filled shells they all have um, two S-type valence electrons and six P-type valence electrons. Those are both, those are, that's a completely filled shell and that's why those don't do much. They're quite happy with that configuration. So this graph can tell you a lot of things. So all of, so the, the electron configurations of all of, let's say these elements right here end with NS1, where N is actually the row number or the period number, if you will. So whether it's one, two, three, and so on and so forth. Everything in the second row, their electron configurations always end in NS2. Um, you know, the boron group is NS2, NP1, and so on and so forth, NS2, NP5 for the halogens. And um, a lot of times these elements are described by this. They know that these are S2, that these are, you know, S2, P5 elements. But you look the way that this works out that everything that's in the same column actually has the same valence electron configurations. The number and type of these outermost electrons is always the same. And this is important because as I alluded to earlier, this is actually what determines the chemistry for these guys. And, and that's because most chemical processes involve just the shifting of the valence electrons. The core electrons are sufficiently deep inside that they don't, um, you know, they don't really do much or they don't exchange very much with other atoms. Right. So for example, group 2A, so these are NS2. So calcium is would be described as an argon core 4s2. So I'm skipping ahead a lot here. So what would scandium be? And you know, would the next electron be a 4p type electron or a 3d type electron? And the answer is whichever one is lowest in energy. And that is actually the 3d energy level is actually the next one. So the configuration for scandium, for example, is argon 4, s 2, 3D1. Now, remember I gave you in the previous video a nice graph of what, um, what, the, what the energy levels were, and it's kind of hard to remember. So here's, an, here's another um, way to easily remember this, that you write all the values of N and then possible values of L, each on its own line. And you only have to go up to F. And then you fill them on the diagonal. So you fill up 1S, 2S, 2P, 3S, 3P, 4S, 4D, 4P, 5S, 4D, and so on and so forth. And this will actually, by dumb luck, tell you what the right energy order is. All right, so that's electron configurations. And the next video, I'm going to talk about how to do ions and a couple of exceptions to these rules.